Welcome back to Medinair. In this video, let's continue to discuss about case history and orthodontics. In the previous video, we have discussed about personal information, history, general examination and functional examination. In this video, let's begin with extraoral examination. In extraoral examination, we need to assess shape of head, facial form, facial symmetry, facial divergence, facial profile, facial proportions, and we also need to examine nose, lips and chin. Shape of head Shape of head is determined by cephalic index. And cephalic index was given by Martin and Saller in 1975. It is the ratio of maximum skull width to maximum skull length. The width of the skull is determined by distance between tangents to the parietal bone. And the length of the skull is determined by distance between tangents to the frontal and occipital bone. Based on cephalic index values, the shape of the head is classified into four types which is mesocephalic, dolicocephalic, brachycephalic and hyperbrachycephalic. If the value of cephalic index is between 76 and 80.9, the head type is mesocephalic, but the person have average head shape and normal shape of arch. If the value is less than 75.9, the head type is dolicocephalic where the patient have long and narrow shape of head with narrow dental arch. If the value is between 81 to 85.4, the shape of the head is brachycephalic where they have broad and short head with broad dental arches. If the value is more than 85.5, the patient is hyperbrachycephalic where they have extremely wide head and broad dental arch. Moving on to facial form. It is determined by facial index. Facial index is also given by Martin and Saller in 1975. So facial index is a ratio between morphological facial height and bisegomatic width. Facial height is determined by distance between nasion and nation. Bisegomatic width is determined by distance between tangents to two zygoma points. Based on facial index value, the facial form is classified into mesoprosopic, uriprosopic, hyperuriprosopic, leptoprosopic and hyperleptoprosopic. If the value is between 84 to 87.9, the facial form is mesoprosopic where they have average facial form and normal dental arch shape. If the value is between 79 and 83, the patient is uriprosopic where they have broad and short facial form and broad and square dental arch. If the value is less than 78.9, they are hyperuriprosopic where they have broad and short facial form. If the value is between 88 and 92.9, they are leptoprosopic, where they have long and narrow facial form and narrow apical basal arches. If the value is greater than 93, they are hyperleptoprosopic, where they have extremely long facial form. Moving on to facial symmetry. Patient's facial symmetry is examined to determine disproportions of face and transverse and vertical planes. Normally, face often presents with mild degree of asymmetry. But before moving on to the assessment of facial asymmetry, let's see what Chiang and Lo have with the causes of facial asymmetry. They said, causes can be either congenital, acquired or developmental. Congenital or prenatal origin are facial clefts, hemifacial microsomia, neurofibromatosis, any anatomical changes at the base of the skull, congenital muscular torticollis, unilateral coronal craniosynostosis, positional plagiocephaly. Facial asymmetry can also be acquired resulting from any injury or disease like trauma, fracture, arthritis, infection in TMJ, facial pathologies or tumors, hyperplasia or hypoplasia of condyle, and ankylosis of TMJ. Asymmetry can also be developmental where the cause is unknown. Possible causes might be habitual mastication on one side or constant facial pressure during sleep exclusively on one side or any other deleterious oral habits can also be some cause. We have various ways to assess facial asymmetry starting with four major points which is inner canthus, outer canthus, aloe of the nose and corner of the mouth. By comparing these four points and bilaterally, we can able to appreciate facial asymmetry. Also, intercanthal distance equals to width of the nose and interpupillary distance equals to width of the mouth. With the help of this, we can 
identify any asymmetry in frontal plane. We can also do assess it with the help of a scale. We need to place the scale edgewise by arbitrarily connecting the nasion, bridge of the nose, tip of the nose, philtrum of upper lip and midpoint of the chin. If the face is symmetrical, all these points will be in the same line. In asymmetrical face, the scale of the chin region will tilt towards the underdeveloped side. Transverse facial asymmetry can be assessed by asking the patient to hold the scale and mouth. The patient's head should be held straight. In symmetrical cases, the scale will be parallel to the floor. In case of asymmetrical cases, the scale tilts upward on underdeveloped side. So, transverse facial asymmetry may result in tilting of occlusal plane. Next way is bird's view, where we need to ask the patient to extend his neck back and we need to visualize the patient's face from chin region. The midpoint of the chin, tip of the nose and nasion, glabella will all fall in one line. Alright, now let's see facial divergence. Facial divergence is defined as anterior or posterior inclination of the lower face relative to the forehead. It was given by Milo Hellman. Facial divergence can be classified into three types which is straight or orthognathic, anterior divergence or posterior divergence. In straight or orthognathic, the line between the forehead and chin is straight or perpendicular to the floor. In anterior divergent cases, a line drawn between forehead and chin is inclined anteriorly towards the chin. And in posterior divergent cases, a line drawn between forehead and chin slants posteriorly towards the chin. Anterior divergence is seen in class 3 malocclusion, whereas posterior divergence is seen in class 2 malocclusion. Now let's see what and how to assess anterior posterior jaw relationship. Ideally, maxillary skeletal base is 2 to 3 mm anterior to mandible skeletal base and centric occlusion. So basically, we are going to get skeletal base pattern here. So what we are going to do is, we are going to place index finger at approximately point A of maxilla, which is at the deepest point in curvature of upper lip. And we are going to place the middle finger at approximate point B, which is at the deepest point in the curvature of lower lip. We are going to place the middle finger in mandible. This can be done on the skin points or after lip retraction. This is analogous to holding the hands and fingers like a gun. As I said before, maxilla is 2 to 3 mm forward to mandibular skeletal base. So when the fingers are placed at the respective points, the palm of the hand will be straight or horizontal. So this is normal in class 1 skeletal bases. In class 2 skeletal bases, the maxilla is forwardly placed bringing the point A forward. So if palm is held straight, only the index finger touches the point A and the middle finger is short of point B, right? So in such cases, the palm of the hand points upwards when the index finger and the middle finger are placed at point A and point B respectively. Similarly, in class 3 patient, the mandible is forwardly placed, bringing the point B in front. So if palm is held straight, only the middle finger will touch the point B and the index finger is short of point A. Index finger can't reach point A. In such cases, the palm of the hand points downwards when the index finger and the middle finger are placed at respective places. Now let's assess vertical skeletal relationship. This can be done by assessing either relationship between upper facial height and lower facial height or clinical Frankfurt mandibular plane angle which is clinical FMA. Upper facial height is the distance between glabella and subnasal. Glabella is a point between eyebrows and subnasal is a junction of nose with upper lip. And lower facial height is the distance between subnasal to gonion. Gonion is under the side of chin. In normal vertical relationship, the ratio of lower facial height to upper facial height is 55 is to 45. We can also say this like lower facial height is almost equal to upper facial height. Lower facial height is reduced if the patient has deep bite. It is increased if the patient has anterior open bite. Now let's see how do we assess vertical skeletal relationship with the help of clinical Frankfurt mandibular plane angle. 
Frankfurt mandibular plane angle is an angle formed between mandibular plane which is at the lower border of the mandible and Frankfurt horizontal plane which is a line between superior part of external auditory meatus and inferior border of orbit which is basically orbital to porion. The normal range of this angle when measured cephalometrically is between 70 to 32 degrees. So we get an average value of 25 degrees. Now we are going to assess it clinically. So when these two planes when extended they intersect at occipital region. So we can assess it with the help of scales. Okay, We can place scales at these two points and if it meets at occipital region it is normal. It is well proportioned phase. In high angle cases it is associated with vertical growing phase or clockwise rotation of mandible as a result of which there is increased lower facial height. And the meeting intersection point is before the occipital region. And the intersection point of these two lines will be in front of occipital region and they are called as vertical growers in general. If the patient has horizontal growth pattern, it is associated with anti-clockwise rotation of the mandible or forward growth of mandible. As a result of this, the FMA angle is reduced with consequent decrease in lower facial height and they won't get intersected easily and they get intersected beyond the occipital region. Now let's move on to facial profile. Facial profile is examined by viewing the patient from side. And facial profile helps in diagnosing gross deviation in maxillomandibular relationship. There are three types of facial profile which are straight, convex and concave. Facial profile is assessed by adjoining three points which is soft tissue nasion, subnasal which is point A, soft tissue point A and soft tissue pogonion is the third point. We need to draw the first line from soft tissue nasion to subnasal and we need to draw the second line from subnasal to soft tissue pogonion. The profile of the patient is straight if the two lines form almost a straight line. It is seen in class 1 malocclusion cases. The profile becomes convex if the two lines form an acute angle with concavity facing the tissues. It is associated with prognathic maxilla or retrognathic mandible or class 2 division 1 malocclusion cases. The profile becomes concave if the two lines form an obtuse angle with convexity facing the tissues. And it will be associated with prognathic mandible, retrognathic maxilla or in class 3 malocclusion cases. And that brings us to the end of this video and the remaining subtopics will be covered in next video. I hope you guys found it helpful. Do like this video and subscribe to Medinair for more. Thanks for watching.